right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Are We Where Yet podcast. I am your host, Johnny. We've been away for a while. Uh, the world's gone crazy. And so forgive me for my absence, but I think you can understand because we're not the same place we were um, even a month ago, it seems. And uh, so it's uh, it's been a little taxing, but I'm here right now and I got uh, my mentor, Chris Tortorici in the house. Say what's up, Chris. What's up, Chris? There we go. That's what exactly what I wanted. <laughs> and uh, no, um, I wanted to do uh, a traditional real interview with you and in the, the, the vein of Are We Where Yet? And uh, which is going to go into your life and uh, your journey. But right now things are crazy and maybe we could use a little perspective and I know you're a man of perspective, a man of principle, a man of orientation. So maybe we could shed some light on some of those things during this uh, this interview. So are we where yet? Where are we at, Chris? That is the question. That is the question. I think we're at a credible time of history. Um, there, I think there's whole lifetimes that have gone by and people have not experienced something that's actually touched the entire world at the exact same time. Most of the time, the family down the street is going through something that you're not going through and we kind of hear about it, but it doesn't really touch us. Yeah. You can't, you can't absorb it the same way. Yeah. You know, even if, uh, I remember in one night in one night at my house, two of my neighbors died. Old man next to me on the, on the right and the old man right across from me, but it wasn't my father, you know, it was weird. It was, it, I did it. I guess I felt a little bit more, Mm -hmm. Because there was two of them, but it just didn't hit my house. This is hitting everybody's house. I just yeah. talked to my friend from Bangladesh today, and he's worried sick because on their news, it just said that two million people might die from this thing in his area. Right. And he was very, very uh, worried. So you're, it is hitting everybody all at once, which kind of reminds me of uh, the Tower of Babel in a way, like, there's a story of everybody being together and experiencing the same thing all at once. Well, we're all experiencing the same thing all at once. I, I think what's interesting because of the technology that we have today, if you're going to kind of go with that story, Tower of Babel, they all spoke the same language. And the uh, story goes that God scattered them across the world and changed uh, their languages so they could no longer communicate to each other. And so social media and a lot of these things have kind of put us all not only facing the same virus, but being able to real time begin to share our thoughts. And you got to kind of ask yourself, which one's the bigger virus? Right. Is it this thing that's coming across? I mean, they've got this list of other viruses that have transpired, but social media didn't exist then. Mm -mm. The internet kind of did, but even then there was still not this ability to pick up your phone and immediately text something, you know, that, oh, we all got to watch the Arab Spring, which still was far removed from us here in the United States. But they, you know, I'm looking at in Cairo, people are chanting. And when you start listening closer and closer, what they're saying, they're saying faith. Book, Facebook, you know, but it's got this, you know, they got this uh, Arabic accent and then they're right putting in stones stacked on the street, the word Facebook. So for the first time, all of a sudden, this thing, this virus of revolution is transpiring real time and these governments just can't keep up and, and can't censor at that point. And this whole thing is, is uh, you know, just out of control. So you kind of wonder what, what are we really facing? We, we think it's a disease, but you kind of can feel that what's happening in our mind is actually getting infected long before what's happening to our lungs. Yeah. You know, I, uh, I went through what I went through. I learned meditation about three years ago. Um, before that I used to have these panic attacks. And, um, because 
And what one thing you taught me was, well, look at your life. There's some things that maybe don't line up. So um, meditation was one of the things that helped me look at my life and helped me put things back into the proper place. Well, yesterday was my first panic attack in three years. Now, I do social media for a living, so I'm constantly seeing all these updates. Mm -hmm. And it, it kind of like I got an itch in my throat. And I'm like, oh, there it is. It's the Rona. I'm, I'm, I'm a, okay. I'm a, I'm a casualty. All right. Uh, what am I going to do? My kids, my, uh, everything I worked for. And uh, I got this, this whole fear came upon me uh -huh. and I'm stuck at home with my kids, the kids, um, you know, homeschooling, there's no school right now. So I'm like, I can't, usually I go for a walk. I can't go for a walk now. What am I going to do? I'm stuck here. Like it's just started to pile on, but thank God my sister-in-law came over. I was able to go for a walk and it wasn't the Rona. It was my mind. My mind built this thing up and it was like almost in a sense, it made me feel like it was preparing me for the host for this thing or prepare me as a host for this thing, for this virus to come in it, it, because it started right there. Right. What do you think? I, I, I do. I, I think, you know, uh, you know, I pastor church and probably I, it's as a man thinks, so is he. So what starts to happen is, is that in a preparatory sense, your mind, then your mouth, you know, your mind begins to, to grab a hold of a situation and and your mouth begins to speak this self-fulfilling prophecy. Next thing you know, you, it, it, it's going down. You know, you bring up the mouth. One thing I did, I've, I've been on this journey for a while. I did not speak it. When I went for my walk, I said a bunch of affirmations. I am whole, I am healthy, I am, I am, <laughs> I am perfection. While I went on this walk yeah. out loud, yeah. I don't care if people thought I was crazy. I was walking around Kennedy Park uh, and uh, saying these things out loud, and it did bring a sense of cal calmness after a while. And hey, okay. even even the police used to tell me, uh, "You have the right to remain silent. Anything you can't, anything you say can and will be used against you." <laughs> yeah. So the reality is that words are powerful. The Bible says in Genesis, God spoke the world into existence. So maybe your words are, they really do matter. I think what's more powerful than your words is the spirit that is that they're coming through. You know, I, I, uh, I, I went being there with my kids and, and, um, not being able, and I could have went for a walk, but walking with these two kids, 11 and six year old, it's not a peaceful walk. Mm -hmm. It's you got to be attentive and watch them at every moment. So they mm -hmm. don't get hit by a car or whatever. So it wasn't the walk I wanted to get, but I was, uh, I was thinking like, okay, I gotta, I gotta make a call. I gotta tell some, I think I got the Rona. I gotta go for a walk. You know, and that would have been the first thing out of my mouth. Like, <laughs> guys, you do not understand the seriousness of the situation. I need to go for a walk. I think I got the Rona. Um, I need I need some air. I need some vitamin D. But I kind of just was breathing. Kind of. So, so let me ask you, John. What is? Is it? What if there's a bigger issue than this virus? What would that issue be? So, for my what I'm thinking right now is our minds. Okay, well, I'm saying in a very physical, practical sense. I don't know. What's worse than, than in a very practical, easy well, question? Well, death would be. Death. Yeah. So what we're really talking about is death. Yeah. We're not talking about a virus. Right. Well, one of the things, when I went for the walk too, um, after the soberness started to come and wash over me mm -hmm. uh, by looking at the pretty green trees and all the butterflies that are flying around now, in one sense, uh, I'm not really afraid of dying like I used to be. That's mm -hmm. one of the things I built up in the past three years or four years on this journey. It's like, I don't have the same fear because I know. So between one and 10, obviously it's an imperfect way to ask the question. If, if when you were younger and you're afraid of dying, it was a 10, what is it today? Oh, I would say maybe a five. Okay, a five. Is it possible for it to get to a one? Wow, I don't. Well, that's a, it's, worth, it's worth talking about. Yeah. Because what I'm saying is, you know, there, there are people that have just chose to stop going around the question. Because whether it's a virus, whether it's a war, whether it's uh, solar flares, whether it's whatever, you know, you can feel that all this thing has done 
has brought a subconscious concern to the forefront of people's life. You know, I'm watching this guy on in a video where he's sitting across from a hospital in New York and they got a big semi trailer, huge semi trailer, and they got these bodies on forklifts and they're just putting them into the back of the semi and Mm -hmm. they're headed to the morgue. And this guy's saying, it's going down, man. This is really happening. He's crying. He's like in, in this emotional panic sitting in his car, videoing the forklift, putting bodies in the back of a semi. And you could just feel it that this guy's never been there before. Many people have never been there before. But if we pull back the movie and all of our lives, we've had attitudes about it. We've said things about it. We went to movies about it. You know, we've, we've, uh, philosophized different things like that. I mean, why is it that funerals are this incredible place oftentimes of reconciliation between families? Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, funerals are like the hospital. Nobody wants to go to them, but they end up bringing people into town and all of a sudden you're facing with certain people and there's something about it. So my whole, th- for years now, I've been preaching about the difference between death being a servant and death being your master. It's like money. Money makes a great servant, makes a horrible master. Death makes a terrifying master a wonderful servant. But what would it take to cross over the bridge from being terrified of death to utilizing death? From making it um, your master to your servant. Yes. Because when I was freaking out, it was my master. I, I, could, I could feel that. And, and, and logically, like I said, it didn't make sense because I've kind of reconciled that I'm a human being and we all pass away. And I, I've gone to that five but it, there, there was this hype that brought me back into, <gasps> oh no. <laughs> and then it was like, what are people going to think about me? I got the Rona, you know? And, uh, but it, it's like, wait a minute. I had to get myself like, wait a No, I'm, I'm, I'm one with God. I'm okay. I'm going to come, I'm going to go back to where I came from. And I had to like walk and like talk myself back into, um, a normal heartbeat. So, uh, is that what you, is that like the first steps to making it your servant, not your master? Um, I, I don't want to dictate people's intimate process, but I will say this, you know, one of the things I don't like, and I think most people can bear witness to me is either watching it happen to somebody or it happening to you where somebody is using fear to get you to do something. You can actually get some things done scaring people. The problem is, is that what you start building is resentment in that person. Cause though you got them to capitulate, got them to do what you wanted them to do the way that you did it, uh, starts to build this resentment because we're really not meant to function on fear. You know, there's all kinds of things you put in your gas tank, but it doesn't mean you're, it's not can be good for your engine. You know, nitrous oxide is great for a short burst and getting away from the cops, but you don't want to run that in your engine every day, you know, of your little Chevy Malibu, you know? (laughs) So fear will wreck more than it can produce. But most people live with low grade, medium grade fears on the regular. Because that motivates them to do certain practical, uh, I think could, I think consciously people could do that. I think, but subconsciously, I think that people have just no, though they don't want it, have just become acclimated to being afraid, you know, whether it's financially, whether it's relationally, whether it's spiritually, it's like, it's like they can't get away from it. What can be very unsettling for a person that doesn't realize how, how acclimated to fear they are is to meet somebody in a hospital bed who's telling, who's consoling you. They're about to die, but they're consoling you because, you know, grandma, she's ready to go, but she don't believe it. In fact, you need her to stay for you. You're not. Yeah. How could you believe it? 
So, so to me, if there is a grandma somewhere or a grandfather somewhere who's looking up at you and saying, it's, it's going to be okay. And you look into their eyes and they have this confidence and they're telling you, no, it's time. It's time. Especially if they start passing out instructions. Hey, take care of your little brother and take care of your mom and, and these different things. Remember what I told you? And they start kind of going through the history of your relationship to them. And they're trying to tell you, don't be afraid. Come here. They, they embrace you and the whole bit. And then this person goes away mm -hmm. and they just expose the reality that, uh, they're ready to turn the page. So what many people don't realize is that you are supposed to practice that. Practice turning the page. You're supposed to practice dying. Nobody wants to practice dying. Well, what's sad is that many people don't realize they've experienced it many times. It's a, it's a natural part of life. So give me some examples as far as you know. I lost my business. Okay. So there are people that have lost loves, they've lost businesses, they've lost churches and religions in a sense, they've lost property, children. We've been through so many things. Now, because some of it is self-induced, we don't count that. I'm not asking you how you died. I'm just saying is you've done it. Now, the part that becomes unproductive is our relationship to those things, how we look at it. The Bible says God wants to restore the years a canker worm is eaten. So obviously a canker worm is something negative that is consuming, you know, uh, parts of your life. God is saying, I want to restore those years, but we are so prejudiced against our own past experiences. We don't see how anything good can come from that. But what you don't realize if you died there, there is tremendous value and, and God wants us to go back, not to have a funeral, but to dig it up. You know, people rob graves all the time, you know, they go to Egypt and, and there are things that valuable things that were put in those tombs. You know, Jesus got the keys in hell. He didn't get them in heaven, you know? God is trying to get us to go back. There are people that have said, I'm, I'm in a way, I'm glad I went through that because it helped me. Mm -hmm. There are things that you were supposed to learn valuable things, you know, instead of sitting around reading a book or philosophizing about an issue, those, those things actually happen to you. You're not philosophizing. You own that. And, and so many times God will be, let's go back. You left the keys back there. That's the key. So I, I remember uh, uh, we've had a relationship on and off for a number of years. How many? Uh, oh, like 20 now, okay. almost 20, uh, 16, I think, something like that. No, 20. Oh, my goodness. 20 something. I, it my, is. We're old. 20, John. Yeah, it's more than 20. Yeah. I was 15. So that was a long time ago. Anyway, let's move on. <laughs> but me losing my business brought me back in a relationship with you, right? Yeah. And, uh, I remember you telling me, just let these things die. I don't want to hear that. I don't know what that meant. Uh, just let them die. No, you don't let them die. You fight for these things. I got to get my business back. I got to get my family back. I got to get these things back. And you're like, nah, maybe there's something else. And it took me a while to, because nobody else was talking to me at that time anyway, uh, to uh, kind of, you said, just let them wash over me. Let, let it, let let me just say these things to you. Yeah. I said, let the truth wash over let, you. Yeah. Let the, yeah, let, let this truth wash over you. Just, just let me say them and just hear them for a while. And then I would text you everyone. So I'm dying. And you're like, let it die. Good. Because I could feel these old neediness, this yep. old way I, that I, I needed my business, this old way that I needed my family, this old way that I needed these things started to die. And it wasn't like the things were bad, but it was my approach or my perspective or my neediness that made it or held it in a bad way. Does that make sense? Yep. So now God has restored a lot of these other things to me. 
and now I hold them differently. And it's like, I don't have that neediness. Now there is portions of neediness that, that, that flare up every once in a while. But, um, it's like, well, no, I kind of already died to that. So you want to take that? Okay, go ahead. I, 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 God brought it back to me last time. I'm Mm going to be okay. So is that what you're talking about? Yeah. I'm saying is that if you want to look, explore the issue of life, you need to realize that death is part of that cycle. You know, you have to come to the end of an embrace, the end of a song, the end of a book, the end of a chapter, the end of, of, uh, the end of things. It's like, we don't realize it, but we have this subconscious philosophy that life is this never ending succession of events. You know, that you buy a loaf of bread, it's got a little date on the side. It's not a conspiracy. It says, no, it's, it's going to go, it's going to go after this period of time. Mm-hmm. So you have this time, but the way we hold on to money and the way we hold on to relationship and the way that we hold on to life is not according to design. You know, it's just like, we got this chokehold on the situation and, and it ends up reinforcing our fears. First of all, Mm -hmm. in fact, it may actually inflame what was a low grade fear to a medium or high grade. And then we'll find ourselves the closer we get to the end of things, we're digging our feet in. It's like, we're going downhill. We're trying to stop the slide because we don't understand how death can serve us. You know, Jesus said, Let's the seed fall into the ground and die. It cannot bear forth much fruit. We all want to have the fruit of a blessing of a life, but we don't want to plant the seed and let it die. We don't want to let it die. We don't, we don't, we don't understand the pattern of life. We can't imagine that death was supposed to serve the pattern of life. We can't imagine that the good things were supposed to die. To pass away the best of things. So, so we would go on to something even better. You know, right now during this time, um, there, there was a, before I got here to the studio, <clears throat> there was a, like a meme on Facebook, not really a meme, but it was like a question. And it was how many businesses in Yuma do you think aren't going to make it now? Uh, that kind of sounded a little morbid to me, but uh-huh. that's a real question right now uh-huh. that people are really facing. And all they're facing, John, is what you face when, when did you face it? How many years ago? Uh, I think about five years ago now. Okay. So they're facing what you face five years. Now you, you got another business and you're moving on. Yeah. So see, it isn't, it isn't what we're facing. It's how we're facing it. It isn't what we're facing. It's how we're facing it. Yeah. So, so the, when your perspective changes, you know, I tell people all the time, I said, look, for a believer, whether they realize it or not, your mind is the epicenter of everything. You lose your mind, you lose your way. You change your mind, you change your life because it's not what you're looking at, it's how you're looking at it. So that's why somebody can come here off some boat with 10 cents in their pocket, not even speak the language. And within a short period of time, they own the corner grocery store that you went to when you were a kid. And you're still and yeah, going so to family yeah. might live in the back where they're not supposed to be, but pretty soon they own another grocery store and the gas station. And you're just kind of wondering what did these, these people had nothing and now they have everything. Well, that's the issue of perspective. Mm-hmm. It's an issue of perspective. You know, the Bible says to be not conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's supposed to be a cycle, not an event where it continues to transform, it continues to transform. And, and the best things of life don't come from the outside in. They come from the inside out where you conceive that invention, that song, that child, these things come out of you. But oftentimes before there can be a birth, there has to be a death. You know what I mean? It's like, you have to let certain things go. You know, um, so I did conceive the, the original business that I had media management. I conceived that and that came out of me. It was an idea that I shared with somebody and, uh, I uh, built it up for over like three years and we were doing when it went down and we were actually doing pretty good as far as the world would see from the outside looking in sure. now, inside there was a lot of turmoil and sure. chaos. And uh, now after letting that thing die, the way it died, 
my next business, the business I'm at now, I practice it almost in a totally different way. Yep. There's a totally different rhythm about it. There's a totally different uh, approach, how I approach clients and who I take, who I don't take, um, that I think I wouldn't have had if I didn't let this thing die. If I would have fought to bring it back up, to rise it back up, this the same way it was, I wouldn't talk to the client the way I talk to them now and, and, and see that needs and, and serve in the way I serve now. Yeah. So, so, and when you do that, because it won't be the last time you come to the end of something, but what you get to do is establish a practice is how can this serve me? As soon as this thing transpired, it interrupt, interrupted my livelihood, like many b business owners and people. But I couldn't help but feel there's opportunity. There is, there's great opportunity. And, and uh, you know, for one thing, the nature of how I preach is that people will become more independent, not dependent, but independent. And no greater time is there to be alive in facing something like this and be already have a practice of independence. Because dependency is some of the roots of fear. You know, we try to raise our children so that they can stand on their own. The more independent you are because of your practice, the greater chance from your perspective you have to be able to see opportunity even in the worst of times. And right now is kind of the worst of times. Sure, and it wants to actually have the louder voice. See, death has become the villain in every, in every drama. But you get to decide in your perspective, how would it serve you? You know, if you have a bag of seed and you have a vilified death, the farmer isn't having a funeral when he puts these things in the ground. No, he's calling busloads of Mexicans that are going to be there, <laughs> yeah. you know, 30 days, 45 days uh, or two months later, because they're going to come and reap this harvest here in Arizona because he's got faith in death to serve him and make him prosperous. There you go. He's got faith. The person that thinks from a, a level of generations, you know, most, you know, the guy that understands where there's a beginning, there's an end, lets that end serve him. And he begins to talk about the end to the people that are, that are younger and what he starts to do is says, okay, we're going to come to the end of this chapter. Now, if he's going to be gone at with the, in that particular end, he's already building this culture of what it looks like to continue. So he's able to go on, not because he's trying to be morbid, but because he's trying to give everybody that's inherently within his tribe or within his culture, the greatest chance to maximize what's going on. So you would have to speak about uh, these people that are going to experience your end mm -hmm. and get out of their head this fear and this whole thing. Because, there, you know, how many people come to the end and the family tears itself apart because nobody has a, an understanding about the end. So the will's not made, the property goes into probate, all these different things transpire because we don't want to explore the end. They didn't make any room for the end. But, but how but the beautiful came. for the guy that does, mm -hmm. that he sets things in place so that he literally gives the family orientation toward this period of time. They already all know. And, and a sense of will and a sense of inheritance and all these things are there. And so there isn't this frenzy like a riot, you know, during a power outage, you know what I mean? It's like, no, this is the culture. We, we discuss the beginning and we discuss the end. What would you say to somebody that would say that that's weak though, that you would give these things up in a certain way that that's, that's weak. Well, I would introduce you to the person who's going to receive it because, because if the person is, if they got to talk to the next generation, you know, where you're looking at a young man who's already things are being transferred over. See, I think what's very difficult is if, let's say a father is very successful, but he doesn't hand that success till the last minute, uh, that success could destroy a son's life. But if he brings that son in early 
and there's an apprenticeship kind of in relationship to the richness of that situation physically, relationally, as far as the family goes and spiritually. Well, everybody's going to already know because that's already what's been going on. And you're going to have this very graceful transition because it's already been transi transitioning. Mm -hmm. Okay. But if you suddenly do it, uh, what ends up happening is there's no culture to support that. That, that because, because that's, you know, when you get on a freeway, you don't just jump from one freeway to over the overpass. No, you merge through a process. So if a person's able to merge into a place of authority, into a place of prosperity, into a place of executorship that he's stewarding over this inherent thing, then what ends up happening is everybody's able to acclimate to that growing sense of authority, that sense of destiny. And so there's a graceful transitioning that nobody's really surprised about. Mm -hmm. So in the Bible, when it talks about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you know, it's, it's giving you a type of design that this is inherently what it looks like to build a culture, to build a tribe. So, and uh, right now when people are losing businesses, some people are literally losing family members to this, this virus. You're saying there's a place that this can serve them and they can also have a certain peace about it. I, I think what's what, I think you cannot build a culture overnight. Um, I think what can happen during this time, I think there are probably already people saying, Hey, we should have been, we should have had these certain things. I knew we should have saved a little bit more money in the bank. Mm. So what I'm trying to say is what it can do is that this thing that seems horrible can become a servant to people to start to build that culture. Oh, Cause can, this won't be the, they're already saying that this thing could come back next fall. So the, you're saying this could be a servant as far as like, okay, now I could start to implement these things that I knew I should have done. I knew I shouldn't have bought that. I knew I should have put that into a savings or um, into some type of thing that would be more beneficial. So that's how you make this your servant. Right. right. So when I shared with you the car that I was going to buy, mm -hmm. you know, three different times, three different cars and uh, probably within the last uh, six months, six to eight months. And I backed away at the last minute on each one of them. Oh, well, the last one I backed away from and didn't do, I got let go of my job. That was, I was very successful and got let go. So it was a good thing I didn't buy the car. Then this thing happens. Which so, makes it a really good decision you didn't buy the car. Because I kept the money in the bank. So it took care of me. So it was like I could afford it in one sense, but I just felt a sense that I needed to not do it. And you have a practice of sensitivity of feeling, maybe I shouldn't do this. Yes. You, that, that's a, a practice that's been established in you. Like, like you hear this voice or you hear this sense that, um, mm, no, maybe I shouldn't. You entertain the idea of getting it. Like you went through the process, you talked to the people, uh, but this voice is like, maybe not. Yeah. And, and since you had the practice of it, you didn't listen, um, to the voice that's saying, get me, get me, get me. You listen to the small voice I said, no. Yeah. And it saved you. First, first, uh, it became your salvation in a way. That's why in my church that I, the, the church I'm pastoring now, I've pastored before, but, uh, one of the things back then when I started out, I felt that God had given me the liberty to establish a church, but not take an offering. Um, and I'm not against churches that take offerings and pastors that take salaries. But what I wanted to do was a bit of an experiment and see if people, once they got to a place of strength, would simply be considerate and start to give. And in the meantime, I wanted to come in my faith to God and say, I want to take care of this ministry financially in this situation. So will you help me to do that? And, and that's what ended up happening. So you wanted a certain sense of ownership of this situation without having to depend upon the people. You wanted to give the people their space. Wanted to give people 
I wanted to be independent and I wanted to build a culture of independence and see that even though we are all independently having our experience, is there still room for consideration? And so what ended up happening is people became very generous and were considerate. But most people that walk through the door aren't coming in because they're millionaires. They're coming in because they're struggling relationally, financially, and spiritually. So, you know, if they give their life to Christ and they become a new believer, it's like a child growing up in a house. You don't really sit a child down with your bills and tell them, Hey, you know, that dinner you ate tonight, you gotta be grateful. You know, how much, how much you got in your piggy bank? You know, it's like, you don't do that. What you do is let the child begin to explore. Now you do introduce responsibilities and things like that. And they get to watch you give, or they get to watch you pay for the bills, but you give them this period of time as a child to kind of grow and come to this place. So I begin to explore the question, what if people would actually grow to a place of maturity and begin to look around at the evidence that, hey, at this church, the lights are on. They serve this stuff there in the, in the kitchen, you know, coffee and all this stuff there. The toilet always flushes. It's like the property, the dumpster. Out. And all of a sudden people would actually, yeah, coffee usually by myself with them. They, or they would watch somebody else give in this box in the back, you know? And what started happening is like a family, people would mature to certain stages and it would catch their attention right away. It does with a lot of visitors. Hey, you guys don't ask for money. Well, don't you, it's like, yeah, we need money just like anybody else. But the thing is, I just wanted to see if we gave people time. Could something be established that actually was far more, uh, they owned far more of the dignity of doing that and came to this place. And could this person ask this person, Hey, I saw you giving in the, the, the box. Is that where the offering goes? Yeah. Hey, I feel horrible. I don't have anything to give. What if that person would talk to this person and said, look, dude, we're all at a different place. We're all growing. You're going to be fine. Just, just come, mm-hmm. you know, people come to me and they're like, Hey, how much are the coffee and the, it's cost anything. And, I don't charge at my house. I don't, I don't charge here, you know, but there are responsibilities. And in building those, uh, independent people, which I've been, I've been going uh, to your services for a while now. We're in a storm and you right now, and you say storm, they wash away and they also prove people. Yes. So you're trying to make those, or you're trying to, uh, build a culture of the people that are be able to stand up during the storms. Yes. And, and what starts to happen is now if you're functioning based on independence and consideration, you know, there are people that have needs right now in the sphere of your own world. And, you know, I get, we're, we're all, I got people, everybody's calling each other, you know, it's like this, you know, I've, bought two cases of toilet paper from a janitorial supply place to, you know, so that people could, if they need something, we can get it to them. Uh, I'm not taking on everybody's responsibilities, but in my world where my sphere of influence responsibility, there's, I can help that area. I've been around the world many times. Uh, that's, that's kind of beyond my budget. Mm -hmm. And it's sometimes it's almost easier to go, somewhere where nobody knows me than have to face people that do know me. So there seems to be a little bit more by design that I need to face the people in my world and check on them and see, Hey, how are you doing? And, and, uh, do you need some help? And, uh, and what that does, it builds a powerful family, you know, just the cohesion of that. The fact that we're with functioning within our means, there's still room for sacrifice there, but it's like, it, it is happening. Mm-hmm is happening. It's happening. And here's the storm. Businesses are being lost. People are losing uh, family members. There's a lot of uncertainty going on right now. One of the things I've learned is that the uncertainty that's going on is because we put our faith in an illusion in a sense, the thing that wasn't real the whole time. How do we have certainty right now? Well, Um, I believe, you know, that it's like I said, looking at that person that's laying in that bed that said, it's time for me to go. 
I don't think that that confidence got established at the last minute laying in that hospital bed. I believe that there's some people that explore throughout their lifetime. You know, what is success? What is love? Who am I? Why am I here? What is this life about? You know, some people have entertained enough things that they thought were going to satisfy knows that they don't. So they don't stop there. They start to explore, okay, what is satisfaction? And I think what happens is, is that we grow in our relationship to the truth instead of pretending uh, that a greater chance for confidence can be established. So for myself, living in the Western world, I felt convicted to have a basis for that truth. And so that truth is quantified in the context of, uh, of Jesus Christ. And so he says, I am the truth. I am the way. So he's more than static truth. According to the Bible, he is personified truth. He is the embodiment of truth, an organic living entity of truth. Well, the difference between static truth and living truth is one's got a voice. The other one does it in a sense. And there's more accountability if, if you got to face it than if it's just sitting on pages on a book. Mm -hmm. And then when, when you're saying that, just so for my audience, you don't believe, uh, or you could believe, but it's not that this old uh, Jewish carpenter named Yahshua or Joshua is actually still alive, but the essence of what he did, what he loosed into this world is still here and available to us in one sense. Uh, I believe because, uh, you know, I believe that Christ it was very much alive, just like you're alive. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, if I, in fact, I believe the oneness that's in Christ is in you and that 2000 years ago, Christ took on the name of a man. His first name was Jesus. Gotcha. Your first name is John. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is I believe, I believe that he came, that he died, that he rose. And I believe that the same factors are available for us. So could you say, and remember, this is my podcast now. This is all open. I've got a bunch of people that uh, listen from all different backgrounds. That he came, he died, he rose. And then he came again, he died, and he rose. And he came again, and he died, and he rose. I believe that every believer that has embraced Christ is able to say, whether they realize it or not, that the passing from death into life, death into life, death into life, in a cyclical nature, that they have participated in that. Gotcha. He said, my body has many members. I don't believe that death was supposed to have been an event. I believe that death has supposed to have been a practice. I believe that in our lifetime, what's supposed to be the antidote for us being terrified about a certain date that they're going to put your name in an obituary is what the antidote to that fear and the basis premise for our confidence is as we come to the end of things that we have the chance to pass from death into life to the point that we become so confident that we, death starts becoming more and more our servant and less and less our master. So though, because some things you're not going to escape, we have a tendency of trying to go around things. The person that practices will go through things. They stop trying to get away from it because they say it's coming. So what ends up happening is they chose to go through it. And not only do they chose to go through it, but they try to go through it in the most sophisticated manner as possible. Yeah. And the story of, uh, Jesus, Yahshua, this uh, Hebrew uh, carpenter, he chose to go through it. He chose, Absolutely. He chose, he bought into this thing and chose to go through it. And you're saying that's like a principle that we're available right now to be able to embrace. Well, I, I wouldn't really don't want to embrace the topic, the, the, the statement he bought into it. I believe when he was on the cross and he was suffering and he was saying, uh, Father, why has thou forsaken me? I, I believe that he was suffering like we all, like if you lose a family member in your house, somebody you love, it's very 
possible you're going to feel incredibly alone at that moment because you can't do anything about the fact the person just died. Okay, but Jesus went from saying, Father, why has thou forsaken me? To into your hands I commend my spirit. Before he even got there, he was in the garden. Father, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. So in between that point of fear and crisis and uncertainty, and all of a sudden, this whole uh, reorientation is a space. And in that space right there, I believe he was able to reorientate himself. And I believe his reorientation had to do with who he was. Yeah, because and the reason why I got some pushback here is because you know, we're in a, a, a real state of chaos, right? Yeah. The, the, this is real. It's tangible. We have stay at home orders here in our own state. Some states have more than that where they can't leave at all. Um, people are dying. And just to say Jesus is the answer. I've heard that over and over again. And that's not going to be the band aid that fixes these things. No, you know? that's no. not. And there are churches that are saying that. Just remember, Jesus is the answer. Remember, Jesus. And I'm like, uh, I'm going to go to sleep because you're boring me. And I've heard that since I was a kid. Yeah. So what do you mean when you say that? What I'm saying is that before Jesus came, who was the answer? Because people were dying all the time before that was transpiring. You know, 4,000 years of Old Testament religion was really not what God wanted to do but he had to let things play out for, you know, for a period of time. They called Jesus the second Adam because what God really wanted to do was have this profound relationship of oneness going on and walking with, with man in the cool of the day. We really don't understand how sophisticated that really was. They're calling Jesus the second Adam because God's trying to get us back to that sophistication. You can't tell a person they just need to believe. You have to give them a basis of why. Okay, faith involves trust. Trust needs a premise in which to base it upon. You don't go to the bank and say, hey, trust me, I need a loan. No, they're gonna ask you, we like to see your credit report. Uh, what kind of assets do you have? Uh, do you have any equity on your home? Whatever the case may be, because they need a premise in which to trust you. You know, you talked about the, um the story of Adam and Eve, which I don't take literal. I, I don't, I don't take it as a literal story. I take it as like a archetype or like a, a map because, um, now I, I do believe that God wants you to walk with him in the cool of the day in a certain way. Right. Because that's part of the story. But what does that mean? Like, so, so let me ask you this. If you don't hear, if, 2000 years from now, somebody reads the book of John. Mm -hmm. My book, the I, book of John Porter. I get a book, the epistle of John Porter. Should they believe in that or not? Bible says you're a living epistle. Mm. Well, I did live and I did go through things. So, okay. So I'm just, that's my pushback gotcha. about Adam and Eve. Okay. Because I think that pushback is unnecessary. It's, it, because it's unnecessary. Jo because John Porter is not an archetype. He actually was a person that lived. Okay. So, so the, 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 the question is unnecessary. Let's just take it for what it is. The statement is unnecessary. Okay. Because what I'm saying is, is you're, you're, uh, if you're a human being and you're a relative of Adam and Eve, I don't know. I don't know how to denounce their humanity mm -hmm. if we're not going to denounce yours. Gotcha. So my point is, that's not even the strength of the, of the issue. The strength of the issue is the reoccurring principle that the story and Jesus being called the second Adam is showing up in 2020 is that God is trying to get us back to a point of sophistication. My, my security is not in the physical story anymore that's in, in your physical story. My security is in the reoccurring opportunity and, and foundational premise that keeps showing up and available to us. And, and when you say keep showing up uh, in the Bible, there has been a lot of men that have heard the voice of God. Abraham went and did his own thing when people are like, where are you going? What are you doing? This is normally what we do here. He's like, yeah, but I, I feel called over here. And then you got Moses and 
on and on. And you got the prophets that listened to this voice that walked with God in a certain way. You got Enoch, which is very brief. It's just like he walked with God and he was no more. Melchizedek. Melchizedek. You got these. So you're saying. They didn't even die. Yeah. You're saying these. So that's the key is that this is available right now in this time of uncertainty. It's, it's like right now, you know what they're doing with these patients that have been healed from this coronavirus? You know what they're doing with their blood? They're, uh, I think they're testing it, right, for antibodies. And they're going to, what are they going to do with it? Oh, it's the, so it's the vaccine, right? So, so, so what is the continuity between their blood and your blood? You're both human beings. It's totally applicable. So there is a oneness that's involved in the conversation. So, so the principle is repeating itself. They're saying animals do not carry it. They're saying humans carry it. So that's from a negative standpoint, but they're even taking this negative standpoint and using it in a positive context that's going to bring healing. So what brings the healing to me about this period of time is the continuity between me and Christ. The way it's normally preached, there's a separation. And the separation is I'm a sinner and he's perfect. And you got to get to him. And, and I'm saying is I, I don't know. I was never separated from him. My perspective said it was, but being born again, what I woke up to is the fact there was never a separation, but as a man thinks, so is he. So the reality is I would live my whole life based on my perspective. What can be tragic is to be so close and be so far away at the same time, because your imagination has hijacked the situation. Entire religions have been built on this lack of perspective. Uh, and, and, and so you're saying, so the, then the question would be to me, Chris, so what you're saying is that no matter I I didn't live like Christ, that I'm still connected to him. Okay. Then my question would be just because my children have been in my home and, and they are in me and I am in them and they, I am their father. I'll always be their father. Does, does, does their um, um, season of their life that say they struggled, does that constitute relationship because, because we're still together? And does that constitute that I'm sanctioning anything? Or could it be that my relationship to them is more powerful than their performance? And that I'm still gonna challenge them on the issues of relationship you know, the quality of the relationship, no matter where they're at, no matter where they're at. I love them no matter where they're at and where they're at. I am there because the physicality of who I am, it doesn't constitute my whole sense of being. I'm in God. He is in me. He is there. He is omnipresent. He is everywhere. So I'm not praying to God because he's way over there. So he'll touch them way over there. This is a whole misconception of what's going on. He said, what can separate me? from the love of God, what principality, what power, what famine, what nakedness, what sword, nothing. But if your perspective or your religious perspective has created an absolute separatism, uh, a religion didn't start in a building and started in somebody's mind. The reality is we're going to keep reinforcing the separation and, uh, and we're, we're undercutting how phenomenal when he said where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. I'm not sanctioning sin in a horrible performance. I'm just saying is there's something more powerful going on than so, the nonsense we find ourselves in. So you're, you, you feel certain, right? You have a certain certainty about this and I, I could see it the way you carry yourself. Well, that's what I'm saying. It's really, I started out wanting to feel it and found out that I needed a heck of a lot more than just a feeling. When you find out, he said, my body has many members. My house has many mansions. He's talking about, he's using all of these physical illustrations to communicate. There is no separation. My body has many members. Well, if I am in him and he is in me and there is no separation, then anything that I need, I am because he is. Now I am not by myself any more than the hand's going to exist and get operating if it 
it's cut off at the wrist from, from the arm and the rest of the body, some horrible things will happen there. So I'm, I'm just saying is that what I was preached to, what I was told is not, it's not what that book was saying. So right now in the midst of all this chaos, in the midst of uh, these constant reports of all these people dying and the, the body bags and Italy, just people dropping like flies. You're saying people can have a certain confidence. I'm saying that people can have a confidence that transcends death. Confidence. It transcends death. It doesn't get rid of death. It transcends death. So would you say that people could speak as confidently as Christ spoke? I think that's what they're, that's what the whole challenge is until you enter into a practice that would leads you into that greater and greater and greater sense of confidence. If you're trying to be like Christ, I think you're, you're testifying of a separation. I think if you're trying to wake up to a greater realization, you're already there. You're just trying to own more of the understanding of where you're at. You're not trying to get anywhere because the you're common, there. the common right now would be, and, and, and I've seen it uh, work in a, a certain way because uh, my best friend, CJ, citizen name, uh, who passed away after 9-11, a tragedy happened. He freaked out. Um, he, we were friends before um, for a while, and then he called me. He's like, John, I know you're a Christian. What do I got to do to become? I, w- I don't want to go to hell when I die, right? Yeah. And that was the introduction. Like I was like, okay, you got to accept Jesus into your heart, right? Now, I don't. I don't look at it that way anymore in one sense, but it, it was the introduction and CJ grew and became a beautiful human being that touched a lot of lives after that. And, uh, but he had to grow into something else because he literally faced death and he went and he was confident on that bed. Before. And, I, and I challenged him a number of times before he got into that bed, said, what do you want to do? Came to one of my Bible studies and I just sat next to him and he just said, so are you here to die or are you here to live? Which seemed insensitive at the time, but the reality is he wanted to be there. Well, if you want to be there, let's have a relevant conversation. And you could just see it emerging resolve started to happen in his spirit. Mm-hmm. To where he was all challenging you guys by the end of it. And he was. And, and, and so the reality was, is that his confidence on that deathbed, I remember them taking a big freaking rod with it, that had a, that was a pipe and jamming it through his chest, sitting in front of his hospital bed because his lung had caved in and no anesthesia, no nothing. And just rammed that thing right through his rib cage in front of all of us. And he just looked at every, all of us like you guys. Okay. <laughs> Cause he had been suffering for so long to imagine what he was going through paled in comparison to the pain of that thing getting rammed through his chest. Mm-hmm. But he looked at all of us and the lady looked at him and it's like the nurse had to recover. But he was, but uh, all of a sudden they put air in that tube and inflated his lung and he was okay. And to him, it was just another rodeo that he's been going through, you know? So you could just tell, here's a guy that's not philosophizing. No. He's there. He has a practice. He's laying in a bed, challenging the men standing around his bed. Because what's happening is a lot of the mystery that's terrorizing us and scaring the hell out of us, this guy has already faced those. Now I'm not saying he didn't have any uncertainty to face, but I'm just saying is, is this guy was able to kind of take this thing and make it serve him. Mm -hmm. I think the people that had the real struggle were the ones standing around the bed. And that's, and I was one of the people that been around his bed a few times and that's the truth. So, so, so my thing is I see what's happening right now as an opportunity to explore and to understand you're watching You're watching. It looks like a medieval movie in Italy where the bodies are being stacked outside. They can't pick them up fast enough. You know, it's like a plague that went through Europe back in the 14, 1300s, you know, it is what it is. We're just so far removed from it. That's why we don't know how to relate. And what God is saying, even if this never comes back, you're going to come to the end of things. And it's not the graphicness that's going to change your life. 
it's, it's, it's the spiritual premise of you approaching the end of that business, the end of that marriage, the end of that child's life, you know, the end of these things, as you come to the end of these things and realizing that term and this too shall pass. And after, at the end of every one of these deaths, there's a resurrection. People that thought I had a love and they lost that love and said, it's over for me. I'm going to be miserable. I just want to die. Have gone on and got married again. There was a resurrection. Now they may not have quantified it in that religious term, but the truth is that they rose. Yeah. There was a death, a burial and a resurrection. So the, the key is to go back and take the credit. Now I do think that we need, you know, people have offered me Buddhism and different other Eastern cultures that have similar truth. I'm not from there. I'm from the West and, and God has told me you need to, this is your culture. I grew up as a Catholic, you know, I, uh, you know, went on to be good, got involved in a Protestant religion for over 30 years and resigned from that. So this is the world I'm from. And, and, and to me, the Bible is so powerful. I hold it differently than, than a lot of, uh, my brothers that are ministers. Uh, and I believe God is with every one of them. Yeah. Cause when I went on my journey, uh, to reorientate myself, I had to, uh, I was introduced to the Tao, the Tao Te Ching and Taoism. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, that helped give me a sense of orientation It helped ground me again. Mm -hmm. And I remember I, I got pretty deep in it, learned meditation, a lot of these different practices. And then I would go and I would talk to you about these certain things. And you would say, yeah, that's in the Bible. And I would say, no, it's not like, no, yeah, that's in the Bible. No. And like that too, that's in there. And I'm like, no, it's not like I, I read the, I grew up around the Bible my whole life. And you challenged me over and over again. And then it was like, you'd open up Hebrews, the, the, the mystical book that's very hard to understand. And it's like, yeah, this is right here. And this is right here. And this, it's like, oh my goodness. Well, how come I didn't see it? And how come nobody told me it was there? Because we don't understand it. So I had a death. One of the deaths that I had was, was a, a chapter of, of, of a religious experience. And, and, and so what I began to realize that the Bible was far more transcendent than we ever realized far more transcendent far. I just incredibly, incredibly powerful. I think that I think people think Jesus came to preach hell and heaven. Jesus came to preach the kingdom, a divine reality that is accessible. Now something that that's available to every human being right now, beyond religion, beyond right perspective right now, right now, right now in the midst of coronavirus 2020 right now chaos. And there are options that end up touching the physicality of our experience. They don't just make us philosophers. It actually manifests itself in the physicality of life, you know? And, uh, I started exploring many years ago, uh, and, Sadly, I would, you know, the more I discovered, I didn't realize I also had to discover how to hold it. So I had to kind of check myself, my attitude, be a little more considerate towards other people. And, uh, but at the same time, having said that, you know, this did, I've had people come to me with their Bibles after so many years of church history and want to know how long has this been there in my Bible? It's been there for thousands of years. Yeah. Um, I started to look at the Bible in a different way, not as a religious book that, uh, a, uh, a Jewish tribe would own or a Christian religion would own, but a book that just gives principles and almost like keys to have a good life. Yeah. Not, not a religious book that I, I don't really look at it that way anymore. I just look at it like if, well, if I put these practices in, in my life, if I do this, that it says to do, I live a certain way and I get a better outcome. Now that's just on a practical sense. But then once I start to dive in a little bit more on the intimate thing, when I go on my walks with God in the morning 
and my mind's exploding with all these things and these ideas and I'm giving birth to stuff, that's like a whole bonus on top of the Bible. I think what's powerful is that I can sit with the most fundamental believer, right wing fundamentalist, hell, heaven, spiritual warfare, the devil, Mm -hmm. whatever you want to come at and, and be in consideration to that person. Jesus said, there are things I want to tell you, but you can't bear them. He told that to his disciples. I'm sure anything he had to say would have been pretty awesome. Yeah. You would want to know, right? Like, but the, give but us the, the key. But his priority was not what he had to say. His priority was his consideration. He said, meat is made for bellies. Bellies were not made for me. That's a conversation of priority. Bellies are important. Meat's important. But he says, what's more important than the meat is the belly, the person. There has to be a certain order to the way these yes. things work. So, so what he would do is look at where the person was at and said, that is the priority. So once again, in this podcast, where you're at, those that are listening is where you're at. That's the priority. God is with you. Okay. And so what he is telling you, if he's saying, get off of this podcast, this guy's out of his mind. I would listen to that. If you feel that it truly is God. All I would do is understand he may bring it back up to your mind a year from now, two years from now. Remember when I told you to get off that podcast? Well, the part that pissed you off, the guy was saying, that's what I'm trying to tell you now. Yeah, let's revisit that. Let's revisit it. Because, you know, I I, I don't really believe in Santa Claus. Uh, you know, if I see him at the mall and... I kind of know he's the guy from the mission that's making a little extra money. I'm not going to go over there and rip his freaking beard off, you know, and tell all the kids to grow up. That's where they're at. That's what it is. I trust that, you know, that God can reach this kid, you know, touch this child's life. If I'm, I'm in a mosque across the world, I trust God can reach that person. You're not going to kick down. If I'm not going into the only thing worse. Than, the only thing worse than possibly believing something that I don't hold it that way is me taking it from you. Mm-hmm. Okay. Jesus didn't address the, all the, the pantheon of gods and the Greco Roman belief system. He didn't rise up against the government. He didn't, he didn't protest against the Roman occupation of God's people. He didn't protest taxes. So, and I don't think he was a pacifist. I just think he has some priorities. I think his message was so much more profound than the things that we are distracted by today. So the Buddhist comes to you. You're not going to try to take away his Buddhism, no. the Taoism, no. the Hinduism. You're not going to try to, you, you would, I've even seen you push back and tell him to go explore it more. I've sent people that have come to my church back to their church. Yeah. Because if you don't grow out of a situation, you're destined to return back to it. Financially, relationally, and religiously. People do it all the time. Okay. Jesus came out of church. The people that wanted him crucified went to church. That's not a story. That's a tendency. Okay. So to me, it is what it is. You know, Saul rose up, came out of church, the people that wanted to kill him. There's a side of ourself that wants to go on and transcend the former experience. There's the other side of yourself saying, what they told Jesus, who do you think you are? That's not a story. That is a reoccurring tendency. But the principles of the resurrection, of the ascension, of the crucifixion, they are alive and well. The principles, the Garden of Eden is not a geographical location. It's it's a, he said, line upon line, precept upon precept. There's, the premise of it is alive today. The second Adam is alive today. It's a different way to hold the situation, but uh, my heart goes out to the people that are stuck in a cul-de-sac of of going back around in circles and circles because the longer that you go, the more ineffective it becomes. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm watching people. You're going to, 
I believe you could pray for somebody that has coronavirus and not get healed. I, and I'm all about believing there are going to be a bunch of people that you pray for the coronavirus and they don't get healed. And what's going to be really sad is what conclusions are you going to come to at that point? Because if our... What belief, doctrines are you going to create? What doctrines are you going to create? And 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 is, is it possible subconsciously there's a low-grade fear that's going to start to rise? And is it possible you eventually, whether you admit or not, are going to see death as more transcendent than your religion? I'm the type of person, I want to ask the harder question. It's not rebellion. Jesus said, come, let's reason together. He didn't say, come, shut the heck up. Let me tell you what to believe. No, he said, no, come, bring the cards that you have. I'll bring my cards that I have, and let's reason together. So I said, cool. Let's well, get down to why it. Why aren't <laughs> these people getting healed? Why are, why are people dying? You know, why is this happening? Do we blame the preacher or do we blame the person that's being healed? Or is there something that I'm missing here? There's something I miss. I, I think we're missing something. I don't think we need to blame anybody. So would you say right now is the time to add, ask the hard question? Dude, if you got a ministry that you can see people healed in Jesus name, coronavirus, you can see the dead raised. Let's go hit some mortuaries. I want to watch. I've led healing crusades. I've seen people healed. And I've seen a ton of people not get healed. And I've asked those above me, the superior, those that were supposed to know. They don't know. Well, the ways of God are a mystery. Jesus told the disciples, the mysteries are for you. For you to know. The disciples came out with deep, profound questions like, who can be saved? <laughs> because they were frustrated and anxious and they wanted to know. Who could have this kingdom? Who could be? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The problem is we're not doing that. We're not asking the questions. We're not We're not allowed to ask the question. Oh, yeah. A lot of churches won't even, or well, a lot of institutions. People get scared of what they don't understand. You know? I, I'm sorry. I, I just ain't drinking the Kool-Aid. I'm just not doing that. There's to, and, and then to find out there's so much here that is so powerful. God tells Lazarus, come, come forth. But nobody wants to ask a question. So why did he let him die again? God's priority is not the sustaining of our flesh. It's the sustaining of our faith. The way that we're trying to pray for people, we're trying to sustain people's flesh. If we could keep people alive as long as we wanted to, they, we'd never let them die. Mm -hmm. You have people hiding in the hospital. Yeah, let me go. I got I to go. I want to go. It's time for me to go. My questions are answered. It's time for me to go. It's time for me to go. Well, what would you say to somebody right now that's dealing with uncertainty, dealing with possibly losing a... Uh, a loved one, possibly losing a business, uh, just experiencing anxiety. What, what's the first step for them right now? I think that you need to ask yourself, is it possible? I think you need to come to God in an intimate way. You probably won't hear an audible voice, but I think God wants to start to impress upon your heart and your mind. I think the Bible is great because it gives you something to work with. You're a physical human. You got a physical focal point and you begin to open it up and try to find yourself and ask God, God, speak to me, show me. There have been plenty of deaths. There's disease in that book. There's all kinds of things. God wants to open your eyes. I always warn people though, don't get stuck on the stories. The Bible says the letters kill. It's the spirit of those letters that gives you life. So don't get stuck on the stories. Don't get stuck on the letters. Don't get in arguments. Ask God, help me to see what you want me to see. I had a man call me in closing. Man called me out of uh, Riverside, California. And he said, Chris, uh, your name's Chris. I said, yeah. He goes, are you a pastor? I said, yes. He said, uh, he goes, before I tell you too much here, I got to let you know I'm having a few glasses of wine tonight. I said, okay. He goes, I'm a, I'm a, I've been a Christian for many years. Okay. He goes, I got a Bible sitting here and I'm, and I'm, a, and I'm losing my religion right now. 
He said, my son, 11 years old, he died, just died. And he didn't just suddenly die. He had been dying, 11 years old, had cancer between his heart and his lungs. He died the most gruesome, painful death. He said, I've been a believer for many, many years. He was, I did everything the Bible said to do. I prayed for him. I did all of these things and he didn't just die, but he died a violent death. He goes, I got to ask you, is it possible that the God that I have believed in all this time is just a myth? I said, it's totally possible. He goes, how can you say that? Cause you just asked me. I said, first of all, this is a Joe from Riverside. I said, Joe, I feel at a disadvantage because you've had a few drinks. You've lost your son. I mean, what do you say to a guy that, you know, so let me just say that. Okay. So I'm, I'm trying to be careful here. I think it's totally possible that the God that you've believed in all this time is a myth. He goes, well, if you're a pastor, how can you preach then if you think it's a myth? Oh, I said, I don't think God's a myth. I said, you asked me if the God that you believed in is a myth. I think it's totally possible. I think the way that you're reading that Bible and the way that you're holding it is, is could be totally superstitious, but I do believe the word is real. You know, it warns you about the book in the book. It warns you about how to hold the book because I feel like you're just twisting things. I said, at the stake of offending you, bro, you're the one that's upset. You're the one ready to walk away. I said, what if something powerful could come from your situation of your son? And then he got mad. What possibly could, could, could have come out of his death? I said, Mary and Joseph were saved for, by their son. This mother, this father, it's their son that produced salvation. See, if your son had never died and never gotten cancer, you wouldn't be calling a pastor you never knew. After drinking a few beers, talking about walking away from your religion, you are totally out of your comfort zone right now. But it took the death of your son to produce some of the most real questions. You're involved in ministry. He goes, yeah, I used to teach Bible study. Oh, that's even better. You'd still be teaching it. See, the greatest revelation you have right now is the death of your son. That's what you've always had. It just took this event like the coronavirus to bring about the reality of where we're really at, not where we say we're at. I said, but God is giving you permission to decide if this new chapter can be birthed from the death of your son. Cause it sounds vaguely familiar to the story that's in the Bible. Because it's the death of your son that's moved you out of this religiosity, out of this comfort zone, out of this ineffective experience that you're so angry about. Ineffective. I don't think anything else could have moved you from there. Very possibly. I said, bro, God is alive and he's real. The only people Jesus really had problems with were people that went to church. See, you're having a problem with the God that you believed in, but I think the God that we're supposed to believe in is waiting for you to believe. Wow. And I think the way that God wants to open your eyes to that book is to let you get it out of your system to the thing that you care about the most and just show you, you showed up to a gunfight with a butter knife and it's not working. Now, the only thing worse than this is if his death means nothing. You're made in the image of God. You have the power and the authority to decide to let yourself off the hook and let this, let his life mean something. Let your son, let your son save you, bro. Let it work for you. 
Let this death be your servant. Let it, let it help you. He goes, I've never heard anything like this before. <laughs> I said, and and because we're in a famine, bro. We're not in a famine of Bible study leaders. We're in a famine of intimate, revelatory understanding. So. Well, I think that's a good place to end. Um, just to let everybody know, those are my glasses. <laughs> um, just to let everybody know uh, that you have a podcast. If people are interested in more of what you're talking about, because it could be new to a lot of people, um, you could check that out. I'm going to put the link in the description. It's Coffee in the Word podcast. We have his sermons, his lectures, his teachings, and we also have a, a new conversation that we started called The Conversation Files. And I'm going to put the link here in the uh, description for this podcast. So if you want to explore some more, you could check out Coffee in the Word podcast. And um, hopefully this sparks some interest because for me right now, what's conf uh, what's attractive is some confidence and people that know how to orientate themselves or have some sort of orientation in this world of chaos where it doesn't seem like anybody has answers or the people that were supposed to have answers don't have them. So thank you, Chris, for coming on doing yep. this impromptu little uh, session here. Um, and thank you, Red Moon Ale House for letting us set up here. This is the new home for the podcast. We have a new home now, so Red Moon Ale House. And during this time, they are delivering. So if you need to get some food, give them a call. It's a 276, or I'll give the whole phone number, 928-276-9111. And you could also get their menu online, but you can't order online. You've got to give them a call. So uh, thank you to Romero, and we appreciate you guys. And um, we'll be back to uh, normal maybe you know there's i gotta say one last thing i joe rogan put up a tweet before i got here and he said uh sometimes he starts to think that maybe things are never going to go back to normal and then he starts to think maybe normal was just an illusion i like to buy into wow maybe it was never normal it was just an illusion so i'm gonna leave everybody with that so Hey, God bless you guys. I hope you guys are safe. Goodbye.